beloved El Moria and beloved Saint Germain, beloved Jesus and beloved Godfrey, beloved Dwal Kul and Kuthumi, I call to the heart of Lanello, I call to the heart of Archangel Michael, I call for the solar ring around this property and the tube of light around each one of us. I call for the absolute God protection of Church Universal and Triumphant and every communicant and keeper of the flame. I call for the sealing of the place where evil dwells, the binding of the dweller on the threshold of the carnal mind, the electronic belt. I call for the weight of the great causal bodies of all who are a part of the great white brotherhood, even the mystical body of God, to be reinforced within us now. Beloved mighty I am presence, dispel all opposition to the teaching, to the teacher, to the message, and the messenger. Dispel all opposition to the chilas, to the disciples, to each one who is a servant of the Lord. I call unto the lords of the seven rays. I call for the full power of Sanat Kumara and the seven holy Kumaras. Beloved seven mighty Elohim of God, come forth in this hour in the victory of the word. Let thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, O God. Therefore, beloved Lord Lanto, therefore all Chohans, we bow before the chief of the Darjeeling Council of the Great White Brotherhood, and we summon the elect of God in the defense of the descent of his word and his work. Amen. Let us sing to beloved El Moria, number 192. I told you that the next time I came to class, I would read to you the story of how a brother of the shadow and of the left-handed path had entered into a meeting of the masters. This was in connection with the high priest in the temple of Atlantis being a black magician and the son of the solitude, the rye Wallern, not being aware of it until he actually showed himself by his actions at the end of the book. This is from the Magic Presence, page 363. 
In this chapter of the Magic Presence, Godfrey, Rex, Pearl, Bob, and Nada accompany Chananda to Darjeeling, where they attend a meeting of the Darjeeling Council. Godfrey writes, The meeting adjourned, and we were presented individually to many of the members. We had been enjoying the social activities for some few, no for some few moments when I noticed that Rex was laboring under the strain of some intense excitement. He watched one of the members closely for some time and then went quickly and boldly up to our host, the chief of the Darjeeling Council. He informed him there was a spy in the room and pointed out the individual. For an instant, it seemed as if the power within the chief would crush him, but Rex was clothed in a divine dignity that never flinched. That is a grave charge, said the chief. It will require proof. At that moment, the man in question came up to Pearl and realized instantly that he was being watched. He reached into the folds of his robe, drew something forth, and raised it to his mouth. Pearl seized it as quick as a flash, and Bob, who stood near, with one leap pinned the man's hands behind him in a grasp of steel. Search him, said Pearl, as our host stepped forward, and Rex, without waiting for authority from anyone, went through the spy's clothing like lightning. He found all the proof they needed of his activities as a spy. As the chief came forward and saw the name on the papers Rex handed him, he was surprised indeed, for the spy, who was an educated Afghan, had been sent into India by a government that breeds only destruction, and had ferreted his way into the outer ranks of this council to obtain information which he had been using against them. At a signal, one of the brothers stepped forward and led the spy from the room. Brother Rex said our host with a gracious smile, you have served the cause of light well and rendered our brotherhood a blessing of tremendous import. There has been a leak in some of our activities recently. Tell me, how did you become aware of his operations? He has been deceiving us very cleverly. My attention, replied Rex, was drawn to him by the inner power of my I am presence. And as I watched his eyes, I knew he was practicing some kind of deception. It all happened so quickly, I hardly knew in the outer activity of my mind what was occurring. If it had not been for Pearl, my twin Ray, we would have been too late. Outwardly, you three may not have known what it was all about, but the mighty I Am Presence has acted with unerring decision. You see, my beloved ones, how the twin rays can act with the speed of lightning in perfect unison when the great inner presence is allowed to have full control. My sister and brother, he continued, as he extended his left hand to Pearl and his right one to Rex, you will be able to do splendid work for the mighty I Am Presence, the Great White Brotherhood, and humanity. I bless you for that service. What is to be done with a spy? asked Pearl. The man knows what he must do, replied the chief. Let us forget it ever happened. We shall always remember your service to the Brotherhood. I know you may have the desire, of, as I have the desire, to speed along in the book of Philos, and perhaps some of you have even already finished reading it. But you will note that our reason for taking up Philos is to study the teachings of Jesus Christ that come in that book that have to do with uh, what we want to be able to explain to Christians and to people of other religions. So at a very important point in our book, I believe it's on page 136, so today I'm going to take up this statement in considerable detail because I believe this is something that you should be aware of. Philo says, Karma is inexorable and severe, my brother, my sister. But our Savior hath said, follow me. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. We're going to first take up the concept of followers and following the guru, and then we're going to take up the concept of being doers of the word and not hearers only. Following the guru is a profound concept. The only way you can follow a guru in embodiment is to recognize that you are following the spirit of the Lord as the Spirit of the Lord comes upon that personage. 
it is never the worship of the flesh and blood person. And following a guru is to follow the spirit of the Lord that is upon that guru. It is a very delicate and subtle line of reality. And when you leave that razor's edge line of that reality, you can fall to the right or to the left into a state of idolatry. But following the spirit of the Lord who is upon the guru is a sure bet. There is the spirit of the Lord and then there are the conditions that surround the one who bears it, the conditions of the earth, the conditions of world karma, the conditions of the chila's karma that may affect that one, but it never affects the spirit of the Lord. So following Jesus is to follow him by maintaining the tie to his heart, by loving and obeying the Father and the Son who have taken up their abode in him. Following Jesus is very necessary because we need the tie to his heart. I don't consider myself in my human self to be any better than anyone who is in this room. But I know that the spirit of God that is upon me to speak to you and teach to you is far superior than my human intellect or anyone else's. And I am grateful to give that teaching. I am painfully aware when Sheila's staff members, keepers of the flame, stray from the point of realism of their own Holy Christ self because they are in an area of karma reaping. They are reaping karma, karma blinds, and they can be totally convinced by the, the rationale of their minds that they are in a right place and doing the right thing when it is exactly the opposite. Before I came here today, I had to jot off a letter from El Moria to Achila telling that Chila that she was having a very key test a very important test and that she was not passing it and this person is a, is a student of many years and believes she is wholly right in a certain matter on which I counseled her and gave her very definite direction some weeks ago so she has not been able to accept that direction and as a result therefore uh, is experiencing some very difficult karma at this time which is certainly much not my desire it is out of my hands. But the message that I gave to her a few weeks ago was directly from El Moria. And so the message came again today to point out what was happening in her world, which were very severe problems, and which she asked me to make calls on. And so I had to explain that I cannot make calls for you when you are not following the spirit of the Lord. But considering that your own human reason in this matter is superior to it and in this case a preference for the vanity of the outer self rather than the love of the guru and the consideration of just how special is the relationship that each one of us enjoys with El Moria as we follow his path and are with him. And so El Moria by allowing a certain amount of this karma to fall in, in three different instances that were I thought quite severe, was showing her what he had been carrying for her and bearing for her as her guru. And she would have to now decide whether she preferred the baubles and trinkets of this world or the protection of the master from karma such as this, all of which came down in the course of a few days. So it was an example to me as, as I looked on in this situation as an observer with my hands tied of how much, much, much El Moria spares us and how much he does for us and how when he steps aside for a moment, the realism of an individual's karma can be a tremendous impact. And uh, it doesn't take long for a person to be, to be running to the messenger to make calls for them in such and such situation. And so my path and my commitment of many thousands of years of following the guru, the particular guru I was under at that time, has been something that I can testify to and witness to almost forever. I can remember being 
a female disciple of Kithumi in ancient <coughs> India in, in the uh, teachings of the Divine Mother and in the path of Hinduism. I can remember being a, a disciple of Maitreya and of Gautama and of El Moria many times over and other masters. And in this life, my goal was to find that guru and to find that teacher. It is a way of life. To me, there is no other way to live in this octave because until we are 100% karma free and have our full God mastery and the Dharmakaya in this octave, we are always under the dependency of a guru. And once we become independent as God free beings, we are still in that interdependence in the chain of hierarchy. And so the law tells us that there is always someone above us and someone below us in this chain. And we are accountable to both. I am accountable to you, not that I see you beneath me, but I am accountable to you because you are students of El Moria and students of the Masters, and he has sent me as your messenger. And so I am accountable to El Moria for teaching you, and I'm accountable to El Moria because if I'm not accountable, then he has to turn around and pay the price to someone above him for some sin of commission or omission on my part. So now, sitting in the seat of having the mantle of the Guru, I see how much people need that thread of contact and that direction, and how much they are thankful and how much they are grateful when they do receive it, and they can separate out from their human questioning, well, is it this or that? Shall I go this way or shall I go that way? Is my perception right or wrong? Should I make this move? Now, many, many, many times when people ask me such questions and send me such letters, I do not answer them because El Moria says he has no answer and people must apply the path and the teaching and gain their own self-mastery. In other cases, he is very willing to give an answer. And I do not question that and I do not what, know what determines it except, of course, the law itself and the record of the individual that the master is looking at and that I am not looking at. But I encourage you to follow your mighty I Am Presence, to follow your Holy Christ Self, to follow your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and to know that El Moria is an assistant to Jesus in Jesus' role as the world Savior, and that he has come to give us this course, this community, this discipline, this goal fitting in the name of Jesus Christ, and to assist Jesus in bringing our souls to the path and point of individual Christhood. I certainly encourage you to follow El Moria because El Moria, I suppose like any other master and like God himself, has never failed me. What El Moria has never failed to do, which I have appreciated most of all, is to discipline me, to chasten me, and to bring me to the point of that God identification where I could serve you and serve him better. And there is no greater master to choose for that purpose apart from Serapis Bey himself, who is the great disciplinarian, and of course Maitreya, who is a disciplinarian at his own level, a great initiator, and his level, of course, is above El Moria, and El Moria prepares us for, of course, the halls of the great Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So this is actually a pivotal phrase in this book, it's highly pivotal, and I can only tell you that the guidance you will receive from God and from attunement is great. But the dark night of the soul can last for many embodiments. The seat of the soul chakra is below the solar plexus and above the base of the spine chakra. That means the soul is sitting centered in the electronic belt. And the soul must make her way through that karma the levels of karma, the programming, the indoctrinating of fathers and mothers of every lifetime and authority figures and teachers, the programming of the desire body. The soul is not seeing clearly. If the soul has not been able to make the passage up the spiral staircase from the seat of the soul chakra to the Holy Christ self in the threefold flame of the heart and then to the inner chamber of initiation, the eighth ray chakra, if she has not arrived in that full communion with her Lord, the Christ Self, to be the Bride of Christ, she will pass through, in this period of the dark night of the soul, the labyrinth of her karma. And the only thing she can cling to 
is the absolute love of Christ, the absolute faith in Jesus Christ, the absolute conviction that he is guiding her. As I have mentioned in my other lectures in Napoleon Hill, we have talked about the Lord our righteousness and that we learn the sacred precepts, the morals, the laws of God. We study the lives of the saints and the prophets and the avatars to know what they did in many different circumstances. And we develop a body of knowledge of what is right and wrong and aside from having a living guru to speak to us during the dark night of the soul, the only thing else we can lean upon is our faith and our knowledge of the law as it has been taught in all centuries in all world religions. So to go through the dark night of the soul and to have someone in embodiment with that spirit of the Lord upon them can be of tremendous assistance. The dark night of the soul, as dark as it is when you are surrounded by your karma, cannot even be compared with the dark night of the spirit, which is the eclipse of the sun of the I am presence and the Holy Christ self. And the soul has only the attainment of many lifetimes of positive good karma to keep her through that dark night. The dark night of the spirit comes through the initiation of the crucifixion only when you are ready to manifest your full Christhood. But even to the one who is manifesting his full Christhood, it is a tremendous, tremendous darkness. And as you may have heard in other lectures, the moment of that dark night of the spirit for Jesus was when he was on the cross and cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That is the moment when the tie was cut to God and all that Jesus had realized of God in himself must be on its own and stand on its own. And so Jesus had realized the fullness of the Christ. He was one with God and he could sustain that God flame and that Christ flame on his own. So this is the reason why we need a guru all the way home to God. I think that many people who pass through the halls of Summit University neither have the sense of what a tremendous gift God gives us in all the ancient teachers we have known or in this dispensation of this century. They don't know how much they need that tie to the Great White Brotherhood. They do not know that it is a thread and that it is a fine thread and that it can be broken by violent disobedience, by denial of the word of God or of his laws. And that the thread to the ascended masters, to the great white brotherhood, and ultimately to their I am presence can be broken by such actions. Prolonged, unrelenting, unrepenting disobedience to the law of God, to the inner voice of conscience can result in this. And no one will know the day and the hour when his final act of, of disobedience has resulted in the cutting of the tie. So when Jesus gives his teachings on follow me, he is giving that teaching because he knows that those disciples and all who hear him speak will need him Till the end of time and the end of time is the end of your personal karma they will need that tie so here I will take up now the chief sayings of Jesus on follow me first of all Matthew 4 18 through 30 through 22 and Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brethren Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother casting a net into the sea for they were fishers and he saith unto them follow me and I will make you fishers of men and they straightway left their nets and followed him first of all you will note from this passage if you know much about Jesus life that he did not speak those words to everyone that he met. 
These were his brothers when he was Joseph, the son of Jacob, who were jealous of him when he had his coat of many colors. He recognized them, he called them, they recognized him. Both were prepared to play their role in this mission of Jesus' life. When Jesus says, follow me, he is speaking about patterning your life after his word and his work, after the electronic presence of himself in physical embodiment. He is speaking about the Christic pattern that he holds for the Piscean age in this 2000 year period. There are the qualities of Christ that we are destined to embody the Piscean qualities. And following means doing as I say, doing as I do, learning from watching me in action. Therefore, being with me continually, observing my practices, ex observing my communion with the Father, observing my agonies, observing the pain, and, uh, observing the suffering observing how the world treats one who is the embodiment of the Christ and how one who is the embodiment of the Christ reacts to the world's persecutions and ultimately how does a Christed one deal with a crucifixion. I can remember when I saw and witnessed when I was in embodiment the beheading of Thomas More. And I remember how in that life, I learned from the example of Thomas More, and I learned from him how to die the death of a martyr, how to receive that initiation, and how to pass through it. And my sorrow was very great in that life when this beloved one was taken. And if only he had recanted his position regarding the king, he might not have been beheaded. It was a couple of centuries later when I found myself at the guillotine. And I know that the strength that I had on that occasion came not only from Saint Germain, but came because I had been under the tutelage of numerous people in embodiment who became like later became masters under Jesus Christ and in the East. And by showing me the way of the crucifixion, showing me the way of this finale to a lifetime, this denouement, I myself could go through it. This is why we follow the guru. The reason we follow the spirit of the Lord that is upon the guru because we are only three footsteps behind and we will go through all those circumstances and we will have to deal with all those problems and all those questions. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way and when you finally come to that single point of the pyramid and it is your turn to pass through, perhaps as sheep to the slaughter or cows to the slaughter, one passes through at the time. So we pass through alone, although we have been many following our guru. And so we are all alone, as Jesus was all alone in Gethsemane. But everything is inside of us, and we will know exactly what to do. Because somewhere along the way, over thousands of years, a master and many masters have called us, follow me. The master doesn't just say, follow me. He makes a commitment. I will make you fishers of men. Fishers of men means going to the depths of the sea to find the pearl of the soul that has descended into the astral plane. And so you know the Gnostic poem of the hymn of the pearl. And you should review it if you don't know it. And so the soul who has descended into the sea of the astral plane must be caught in the net of the great fisherman and brought in. So Jesus doesn't want followers for the sake of having followers. He wants followers who will continue after him to do what he is doing. At this moment, he is the great fisherman 
and he will make them fishers of men. So if we don't follow the Guru, we never come to the place of the initiations of the Guru. It is as simple as that. This is why we love El Moria so very much, because we love his lifetimes and because we are with him through all that he has gone through in those lifetimes and now what he is going through with a recalcitrant humanity and also many in the New Age movement who do not receive him, do not recognize him, do not value him for the great guru that he is. So these were ready chilas. They straightway left their nets and followed him. And the fact that they did so is also a testimony and a confirmation that Jesus is a true guru in the lineage of Maitreya Gautama Sanat Kumara. Because they would not have been impelled or empowered to follow him had not the ray from the lineage of those above him gone forth from his heart to these fishermen. And going on from thence, he saw two other brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee, their father mending their nets, and he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. Another requirement of following the Guru. You do have to leave father and mother and brother and sister and all the momentums of this world. When I say have to, you may not have to leave them for some time. But if the day comes when they oppose your path or your paths no longer converge or being a part of the human father's business present, prevents you from being a part of your father's business, that initiation comes upon you. The stories that we have in the Gospels about Jesus are archetypal of the Guru Chila relationship, which is why they are so wondrous to read. The second reading I'm giving you is from Matthew 8, verses 19 through 22. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, Follow me, and let the dead bury their dead. Jesus was very strict in the levels of discipline that he expected of his disciples. Not attending one's father's funeral can make one an outcast of the family for life. I am sure you all know this. I am not saying you should not attend your father's funeral. But I am saying that sometimes there are choices to be made in the command to follow the guru. And you will have to listen with your inner ear and listen to your heart and decide with what measure you will follow. The next reading is Matthew 16, verses 21 through 28. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake 
shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Peter was not teachable or instructable. He was also impetuous. Peter would challenge Jesus' works and his words. And whenever he did so, he was operating under his carnal mind. And the carnal mind is enmity with Christ. And the carnal mind is Satan. It is the seed of Satan in every one of us. It is the word of the devil to tell the Christed one that he does not need to go through the initiation of the crucifixion. The Christian scientists, bless their hearts, used to tell me, you don't have to suffer. You don't have to go through the persecutions that Jesus did. You don't have to be crucified. I've had New Age people tell me the same thing. You don't have to bear world karma. You don't need to go through all of this. They may say it in ignorance because they do not know the scriptures, but whether it be ignorance or not, the message is from the devil. Whether it be his unteachableness or his inability to be instructed, Peter was the mouthpiece for a lie of Satan. The only way Peter could argue along these lines was because he wanted to make a God of his Lord. Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. You are too high, you are too holy, you are God. You will not be crucified. That is the same kind of temptation that met Jesus on the desert. The three temptations that Jesus received. Jesus taught this to his disciples, but Peter did not remember how he spoke to Satan and denied those temptations. In each and every temptation that Jesus received, the devil was tempting him to be a God. He promised him all the things of this world he told him to command that the stones be made bread, and he told him to cast himself down the mountain because God would give his angels charge over him. He was tempting Jesus to tempt God and to be a God. So Peter is the mouthpiece, and Jesus takes the occasion to give his words where he says that people must deny the lower self and take up his cross and follow me. If any man will come after me, if you really want to follow me, you must deny the lower self in all things and in all situations. You must take up the cross of your karma. That is what it means to take up your cross instead of letting Jesus bear the cross for you. You must be a cross bearer. And part of bearing personal karma is also bearing some portion of world karma. Follow me means to go through every footstep that I will take in this life. Follow me all the way home to God. Whosoever will save his life in this octave will lose it. I have seen this to be true again and again and again, where people will spare themselves rather than enter the fight for the Lord's kingdom. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, 
shall find it. And that doesn't mean in the future, in the ascension. Those who lose their life for Jesus in this embodiment find it again in this embodiment, and they find it by the greater light that enters their temple, by the Holy Christ self that descends upon them. Losing your life doesn't merely mean dying. If you die in the Lord, you certainly find your life again in the Lord. But in this life, we give up many, many, many things to follow in Jesus' footsteps. And we do find our true life. So these are the questions that the Master asks us on the path. Do we want the whole world and lose our soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So Jesus prophesies that the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Christians take this to mean that in this day and in this time, the second coming of Jesus Christ shall be this, and the reward of every man according to his works is the judgment. And he even says that there are some standing with him who shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now we know that John, the beloved, made his ascension in that life. But we also know that there comes a time in the life of the individual long before the end of the age of Pisces when it is time for his resurrection, it is time for his ascension. In that moment, the individual sees the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. He sees Jesus Christ and he receives him. So it is true in every age and it was true then that some would be initiated unto the kingdom before their physical bodies passed on. There is a second meaning to this statement. And the second meaning is that you can pass from the screen of life but not know death. In the sense, the physical body may die, but you may have such spiritual attainment that it is not really an experience of death for you, and you have never descended into the astral plane and the levels of death and hell. The next teaching by beloved Jesus on Follow Me is taken from Matthew 19, verses 16 through 30. Matthew 19, 16 to 30. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. This answer has always taught me a great lesson. Jesus will first correct what someone says or the manner in which they speak before he will proceed with the discussion. If someone praises you for doing good, you stop right there and tell them that God is the doer. If someone says you're such a good person, you stop right there and say, there is only one good, that is God. Don't allow people to lay upon you compliments because it begins the spiral of self-idolatry by both you and the person. It's also not good to speak this way to people. If I wish to praise someone, I, I say to them, what a wondrous work God has done through you. And I'm so grateful for you being the instrument of this work. That's actually one of the last things I said last night before I went home. I said that to someone. And I will say it all the time. But I don't go around telling people what wonderful people they are or what good people they are. 
because of this teaching. It's very dangerous to do it. <clears throat> if you accept it, then you have to prove it, that it's true. If you accept it, you will immediately be taunted and tempted by devils who will come along and prove to you that you are not good. They will try to make you do something bad. You invoke the testings and the challenges of the fallen angels when you accept praise that should be given solely to God and your mighty I am presence. If we do any good thing and if we are good people, it is surely only by the grace of God because God sponsors us, upholds us, nurtures us because we have a guru, because our karma is spared, because Jesus is bearing that karma. How could we possibly take credit for anything good we do when we consider all that is given to us to make way for us to balance our karma? I mean, life is such an opportunity. So the least we can do is be the instrument of God's goodness and take no credit for it because we are debtors to the cosmos in the first place. Jesus wasn't going to have someone acknowledge his flesh and blood and his person is good because he continually wanted people to know that he was descended from a lineage of hierarchy that went back to God and that God is the only good and we are the instruments. Second thing that he did not do, which a false guru would have done, he would have told this man to follow him if he wanted to enter eternal life. If you want to have eternal life, just follow me. I'll show you the way. No, he didn't say that. Following a guru comes after many other things must first be fulfilled. But even if you follow a guru, a guru cannot guarantee that you will have eternal life. So he didn't tell him that. He said, keep the commandments. You have to obey the law of God. No one is exempt. I'm not exempt. That's why I'm correcting you when you call me good master. And no one is exempt from the law. And if I violate the law, I also will suffer. If you want eternal life, keep the commandments. Now it's also very possible that through this rich young ruler who was questioning Jesus, that there also was coming the temptation. This man wanted Jesus to tell him that he could have eternal life if he would just believe on Jesus. Wouldn't you think that this was a, a very important opportunity if Jesus wanted to ratify the latter-day beliefs of Christians? Accept the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and be saved, and you'll go to heaven. But Jesus didn't take it as an occasion to say that. He didn't say, believe on me and you'll get to heaven. No, he said, keep the law. He was not going to allow this man to make an idol of him or of himself. He saith unto him, which, which laws in other words. So now Jesus recites the law to him. Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth. What lack I yet? Okay, I have fulfilled the law and the prophets. What am I lacking in? Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, which is to say you will not become perfect merely by obeying the Ten Commandments and keeping the commandments of God. That is your basic obligation as a human being living among other human beings. But if you want to be perfected, go and sell that which you have and give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven in your causal body, and come and follow me. Jesus is stipulating the requirements for discipleship under him. This rich young ruler, he perceives, is attached to his wealth. He will not be able to be a disciple 
unless he gets rid of his money. His money is his shackle. That is not true of everyone. And Jesus did not make the same stipulation for all of his disciples. Neither did the Buddha. And the teaching both on the path of the Buddha and the path of Christ is that the same disciplines and requirements are not given alike uniformly, categorically to everyone. But in this case, for this individual, it was necessary. Now, there were disciples among the early Christians, beyond the twelve, who had means. And because they had means, they could support Jesus and support the disciples and receive them in their home. So, when Jesus said, if you will be perfect, go and sell what you have and give it to the poor and you, sh you will have treasure in heaven, and then come and follow me. Then, when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowing, for he had great possessions. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. In other words, it's impossible for a man to pull himself up by his own bootstraps. He cannot do it. Salvation is only possible with God. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and follow thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And every one that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. This is a biblical example of the law of compensation. Here Jesus is promising 100 fold plus everlasting life to those who have forsaken houses, brethren, sisters, father, mother, wife, children, lands, for my name's sake. Elsewhere in the four Gospels, where the same story is told, the words are added and persecutions. Those are also promised for those who give up everything and follow him. But this is not ten times, this is a hundredfold. So that is the law of compensation, and it does work. And you can see that the disciples in doing this did exactly what we were speaking about. They put God under obligation to themselves, but not by design. It simply is the law. They could have done all these things, however, in the wrong spirit. They could have sinned greatly thereafter and lost the good karma they would have made. So do not think that single acts can purchase heaven. We have to have a consistency in our lives. We go to John 21, verses 15, 15 to 25. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me 
more than these. He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Jesus saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all these things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. The master then appoints the time and the manner of the servant's death. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldst. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldst not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that the disciples should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him he shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? This is the disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. These are the last words of the book of John, and it is of John of whom Jesus speaks when he says, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. There are several teachings here, but Peter, by the law of karma, by the outplaying of events, became the outer sign of the head of the church, of the outer church. Mother Mary was always the head of the inner church. There has always been an inner church and an outer church. The Divine Mother has always been at the head of the inner church. Jesus is imploring Peter three times to feed my lambs. The Roman Catholic Church has never fed the lambs of God. They have never fed the children of the light, their members, Christians, the true divine doctrine of Jesus Christ. They have not expounded upon the scriptures. It is still unbelievable to me, but I have educated Catholics on my staff who have never read the Bible, though they went to Catholic Church all of their lives, received catechism, received all things and all sacraments, and yet never read the Bible. It never made sense to them, and only that which was taught to them did they know, and it was taught according to Catholic doctrine. Jesus knew exactly what would happen, and in the context of this, his final words, to both Peter, to Peter twice, are follow me. If Peter would have followed Jesus' example instead of his carnal mind, he would have seen to it that the divine mysteries, the sacred mysteries, the Gnostic te texts were not lost and were secured for us so that Western civilization would not be in a state of such ignorance, truly, 
almost totally illiterate as to the mysteries of Jesus Christ. What's more, this is very literal because for a long time and still in many places, Catholics are not given the communion wine, the spirit of Jesus Christ. They are only given the bread. In some places that has changed and they are given the wine also. But in other places that wine was not served to the people but reserved for the priests. And it has changed over the centuries. This is the denial of the essence, the true essence of the heart of Jesus. So they do not receive the whole Alpha and Omega of the Lord. The death of Peter was that he was crucified upside down in Vatican Square, as he asked to be because he felt he was not worthy to be crucified as his Lord was. And that is the famous story on the Apian Way, which I'm sure many of you know, because Jesus met Peter as he was leaving Rome, going away from Rome. And so Jesus appeared to him, this is after following his resurrection, and Peter said to his Lord, Quo Vadis, where are you going, Lord? And Jesus replied to Peter, I am going to Rome to be crucified again. And by that statement, Peter knew that he must return to Rome to be crucified in Jesus' name. So the manner of his death is explained, prophesied by Jesus here. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldst. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldst not. Peter did not want to remain in Rome. He did not want to be crucified in Rome. But when he met Jesus, he realized that this is what he must do. And in that moment, he truly obeyed Jesus' command, follow me. The final admonishment to Peter again is that Peter was overly concerned as to who was greatest among the disciples, who would fare and how they would fare, who would see the Son of God, who would get to the kingdom, who would not, who would get there first. This is a very famous quote of Jesus, which I use often. If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. The part of the quote that I use is what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Because many times people become embroiled in a sense of injustice amongst themselves. Sheila's squabble with one another disciples squabble, students squabble, and it is usually because they think one person is doing something to do th to them that is not just, or they are not being tre treated equally in a situation. And sometimes it's, a, vi it's a, a vying or a jealousy for the attention of the messenger or the guru. And all of that can go into the flame if you will simply remember the mission and the words of Jesus what is that to thee? Follow thou me. And what is it to you if John the Beloved will receive a greater reward in this life than you, Peter, will receive? Never mind. If you follow me, if you are a Chila, if you walk in my footsteps, you will walk all the way home. You can pursue the study of following in Jesus' footsteps, of course, by reading the red letters in your red letter edition of the Bible. And if you don't have one, just read the four Gospels and bracket the material as you go that are Jesus' words. So next time around, you can come back and see those words. Let us stand for our sealing. Beloved, mighty I am presence, 
I call for the Holy Spirit to descend upon these students and all keepers of the flame and light bearers of this matter cosmos. I call for a deep understanding in the heart of all souls of light and children of the light, of the call of Jesus. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Beloved Mighty I Am Presence, upon this Guru Chila relationship, the entire warp and woof of a cosmos does hang. Therefore, I pray for profound understanding in the West, among all people of light and all devotees of Jesus, to know the depths of this most intimate association with the Lord and with the Ascended Masters of the Great White Brotherhood. I call for this as the divine solution to the ills of our society and our world. Beloved Mighty I Am Presence, I call for illumination to all Christians and those of all faiths that the works of God which we do in humility to the glory of God and in the selfless love of one another are surely the key to the resolution of all human problems and the key to the balance of karma and our assimilation unto the Bridegroom, the Lord Christ to our victory. O God, let us follow thee, the only Guru, and let us truly be the embodiment of thy word and thy work. I seal these hearts in a deeper communion of Jesus' heart, even as we pursue the cleansing of the heart chakra, the cleansing of the unmerciful heart, and the heart of hardness. Help us to know the deeper mysteries of the cosmic Christ by purified hearts. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Divine Mother. Amen.